Welcome counselors, thanks for joining. Um, we're just waiting for the live stream to go up. So we're taking a couple more minutes. Hey, counselor. So Tim is the um, captions today. So Tim, are you all set? He doesn't have a mic on, but okay. it looks like he's in the room at least. Okay, perfect. Tim, I'm sorry for hey, keeping counselor, So Tim is the um, captions today. So Tim, are you all set? He doesn't have a mic on, but okay. it looks like he's in the room at least. Okay. Candace, that just played back to me. Just trying to make sure that we're live. Candace, can you hear me live right now? I can it. The YouTube was up and running, but it looks like we're all set to go now. Okay, we are? Yeah, I think that's why it bounced back because of the YouTube. Okay, great. But I just closed out that screen. So it should be all set now. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Um, so we're ready to go then? Yes. Okay, give me one second. I just want to make a note of everyone who's joined us so far. Okay. All right. All right, we're ready to go. I'm gonna gavel us in. Calling this meeting of the Ways and Means Committee of the Boston City Council to order. For the record, um, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and the Chair of the Committee. Um, I'm joined here today by my colleagues, Councilor Julia Mejia um, at large, Councilor Michael Flaherty at large, Councilor Liz Breeden, District 9, Councilor Ed Flynn, District 2, Councillor Kim Janey, uh, District 7 and Council President, and Councillor Anissa Sabi george also at large. Um, this working session is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov uh, slash city-council-tv. It will be rebroadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Verizon Channel 1964. So the council's budget review process this year is comprised of a combination of public hearings and councillor working sessions. Um, these councillor working sessions do not have a public comment period. Um, they're designed for the council to articulate in advance of the hearings, a set of questions for the administration so that we can have a more productive conversation when we get to the hearing itself. Um, but uh, we definitely encourage members of the public to testify in other ways. Um, so you can do this in a, one of a number of ways. One is to actually attend one of our virtual hearings and give public testimony there. Um, we'll take that testimony at the end of each hearing. Um, and when you're called, we ask you to state your name and affiliation and limit your comments to a couple of minutes. You can find the Zoom link to do that in the public notices for all the hearings. We're also having a dedicated public testimony hearing this evening, um, Thursday, April 16th at 6 p.m., uh, where we'll be taking public comments and questions on the budget really to help inform our scrutiny process over the next two months. Um, so we encourage you to attend that. There's also on the city council website, um, a, a page dedicated to the budget and how to testify. So I'd encourage people to look at that, or you can email ccc.wm at boston.gov or fill out the form on the website, um, which also gives you an option to submit a two minute video. Um, and videos submitted sufficiently far in advance will actually play at the end of the public hearings um, for which they're designated. 
So, and I just want to add, this is something that um, we announced in the council meeting yesterday, but uh, throughout this budget process, if you submit testimony written or spoken in a language other than English, the council is committed to getting that translated for the benefit of all counselors. Um, so you're still welcome to come and testify in person and bring a friend who can translate into English directly at the time. Um, but if you're not able to do that, you can speak in your own language and, and we'll, make a, we'll make a translation happen. Um, so uh, we very much hope for all of your voices in this process. Um, you can read, you can go to the city council's budget website at boston.gov slash council dash FY21 budget. Um, and informally, you can tweet us uh, using the hashtag boss budget, BOS budget. So uh, today's working session is on dockets 0588 to 0590, orders for the FY21 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Uh, dockets 0591 to 0592, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0593 to 0596, which are orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Um, today, we'll actually be focused mainly on the capital budget, um, which is the subject of our public hearing next week, um, and also on the public facilities department, which carries out many of those capital projects, and then on a handful of um, miscellaneous revolving funds including ones operated um, in the law, tourism, and sort of arts and culture space. Um, but I think the lion's share of our focus today will be on the capital budget. Um, for counselors to know, uh, so the plan for this working session is sort of as follows. We're gonna start with people's questions and comments, things that they wanna raise with the administration next week on the capital budget in general and sort of citywide capital issues. And then once we do a cycle of those, of kind of the citywide things, we'll then go to district specific things. Because I think there's a bunch of district specific um, capital concerns that counselors um, want to raise. And so just in order to kind of help have the general conversation be a conversation that we can all kind of participate in, we'll start with those issues that you want to raise that are kind of either an across the board investment question um, or about how the capital budget itself um, operates. And so that's, so that's kind of, and we, and we will, and then after we do sort of general capital concerns, district level capital concerns, we'll do the um, PFD department and then the revolving funds. Um, and I know that some counselors won't be able to stay for the whole duration, but our hope here is to make sure that we get everybody's questions on the record. Um, central staff is taking notes um, and, uh, and we're definitely planning to use this session to create a formal document that we send over to the administration at the end of the day. Um, so uh, with that, I thought that um, I would start out with a few general capital questions um, and, then, uh, and then I'll recognize colleagues in order of arrival um, on that front. Um, so in my capacity as Ways and Means Chair, um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in this year vis-a-vis uh, -vis the capital budget is that, I mean, we pretty much, we know, right, that we're ourselves in a recession and there's a lot that the city level can't do about that. There's a lot of the sort of big picture stimulus that needs to come through the federal and state level. Um, but our capital program is one concrete way that we can both keep pro providing critical things to the people of Boston and also create jobs, create economic development, um, and help to kind of help in a kind of counter cyclical way if we find ourselves in a recessionary situation. And so um, I'm glad that the administration when they were reducing the budget somewhat over the last few weeks did not reduce the capital budget and that um, it is sort of projected to go very close to that 7% policy um, line, which for those watching at home is the city's the city has a policy limit of trying to make sure that debt service, which is the interest that we pay um, on, on the debt that we borrow to do big capital projects, doesn't go above 7% of the operating budget because we don't want it to crowd out lots of other things. Um, but it makes sense, I think, in this case to have a big capital budget, which means you want to get as close to that line as you possibly can. And so my questions for the administration are, firstly, how closely has our actual year-by-year -year capital budget tracked the approved capital budget over the past five years. And I mean that specifically in terms of overall dollars spent. I know that projects can shift, but one of the things I'm wondering is, you know, 
I know that sometimes it's hard to get money out of the door. And that may be especially true in this economy. And yet it's also especially important to do it quickly if we want this to have that counter cyclical effect. Um, so I want to know what steps the administration is thinking about on that front and also understand a little better what's the point at which the debt actually gets engaged in our capital plan. Do we obviously the city council is giving the administration borrowing authorization when we vote on the capital budget in June, um, but just want to understand what the how close to the actual start of projects that debt gets engaged um, and how how we should think about the fact that things aren't getting built right now. Um, and there could be months of FY21 where we're not really building. Um, and so how, does, how is that gonna affect our capital dollars spent and therefore the debt service? Should we be approving more above the policy limit if there's like a certain percentage that's just not going to happen? Um, so just would really like to understand that. Um, and I'm also interested in sort of a bunch of our capital projects are dependent on state and federal funds. Would be interested in a breakdown of how many of those how, what portion of those funds are sort of firmly committed and what portion of those funds are we worried about being vulnerable um, in this moment. So that's the school building authority, um, other federal and state programs. Um, and uh, similarly, in terms of money coming from our transportation infrastructure enhancement fund, which is based on ride share app fees, to what extent um, are those, is that looking backwards or how is that gonna be impacted by the steep drop in rides during quarantine. Um, so those are some structural questions for me um, on a few citywide specific things. Um, the Renew Boston Trust and the ESCO, I just really wanna ask how we're structuring those and make sure that we're structuring them in ways that help the city save money regardless of changes in the energy market. I previously worked at the Housing Authority and I know that the Housing Authority had a series of ESCOs that did not anticipate the idea that we would suddenly start fracking in this country and that natural gas um, availability would really rise and prices would plummet. And so the ESCO wasn't well structured for that. And um, I think in other ways, you know, we're seeing really unanticipated economic situation right now. Um, so just wanting to make sure that we're structuring our ESCOs in ways that learn from kind of the first generation of those and make sure that the city will really realize financial savings from energy savings, regardless of the ways in which the energy markets move. Um, and then uh, thrilled to see the investment citywide in street trees um, and in urban forestry, all the operational aspects there. Um, would like to understand when that doubling is really going to hit. Is that something that can get rolled out in the fall? Will it lead to reopening more street tree pits? We have a number of those that have been asphalted over across my district in the city that people are concerned about. Um, and then with the build BPS reserve, the money that hasn't been allocated yet, I just like to understand, and this is probably, this is a question I'm happy to have deferred to the build BPS hearing, but um, what the timeline on that is, because I know certainly in my district, there are projects that I'd be interested in having in that mix. And so understanding what's the build BPS sort of revert reserve decision-making look like between uh, the city budget department and the school department. And at what point can counselors be fruitfully in that conversation? Um, so those are a series of general budget question, general capital budget questions for me. Um, I next want to recognize if I can find my list. Well, I know who was first. Um, I want to recognize uh, counselor Mejia for any, well, Councillor Mejia is at large, um, so represents the whole city and any questions about the capital budget um, structurally or kind of citywide questions. And similar to the district councilors, I'll ask the, the at-large councilors, if your question is super specific to a project in a given place to save that for the second round. So, Councillor Mejia. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Bach, I am still um, having some technical difficulty. So I, can you come back to me, please? Because I need to log on in my computer, not on my phone. Yep, absolutely. Um, we'll come back to you. So then Councillor Michael Flaherty, also at large. Good morning, good morning, Madam Chair. And so I get to some degree, they're partly specific um, as it pertains to the East Eagle Street shoreline. Uh, you know, one question is, um, I want some specifics on the shoreline stabilization. And also as it pertains to City Hall Plaza, want to know when phase one will begin and also need an update on the Curley Recreation Center. And my ask through the chair uh, is that if it's possible, 
where um, um, folks can maybe bring in like a schematic uh, or they could put something up on the screen um, to be able to, just in case, uh, particularly more for our district colleagues, if a district council has a very specific question as to sort of, you know, hey, like for example, East Eagle Street shoreline, like what, you know, what does shoreline stabilization mean? Can they show us a picture as to what they're looking to do? Um, you know, that would be very helpful. But um, again, that might be more of asking our district colleagues if they have any um, any project uh, in their community that they would like to sort of see a schematic and have have uh, folks put it up on the screen. But other than that, uh, those are so sort of the three um, sort of basic questions I have with respect to capital. And obviously, and, and when you and I met, we talked about uh, I'm here to support any of my district colleagues if there's a capital project uh, in their community uh, that they're fighting for, um, you know, can consider me an ally. Great, thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Um, and, and yeah, I would just say, I think one of the benefits of us doing this ahead should be that if people have particular questions that the administration is able to, you know, bring the kind of backing and information um, to answer them specifically. Um, and I'll say that my, like that my office sort of operating on behalf of the committee, while we'll be comfortable with the idea that there might be a few of these questions that come up in Capitol that are better addressed in certain departmental hearings. Um, so for instance, if my, if my street trees question needs to be addressed by environment or parks, um, but, uh, but it's gonna be really important to us that they all get addressed. Um, and that if they're, not, if they're not answered in the Capitol hearing that there's an explicit plan for when they are gonna be answered in a future hearing. So thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Agreed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Councillor Breeden. Um, good morning. Um, I had I have a range of questions. We have had a, an extensive community process with regard to uh, Alston Brighton Mobility Study, which was looking at our transportation and pedestrian safety and bicycle infrastructure. I was just wondering how the uh, capital plan will reflect some of the recommendations from that Alston Brighton um, mobility study, which has been ongoing for 18 months. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, again, I'm probably going to have some questions around the specific plans in relation to uh, the Jackson Man uh, School Study and the Horace Man School for the Deaf. Uh, how how that process will when it will start and uh, what sort of level of community input will there be into that process? Um, also wondering if uh, there will be any impacts on the plan to uh, the Fandle Branch Library. These are really specific to the district. <laughs> uh, you know, with the change in economic situation, uh, will a plan that has been put on the on the ticket from last year, like the Fandle Branch Library uh, improvements, will that will that still hold and be committed? Is that a financial commitment still there? Um, that might be all for me right now. I'm sure I'll have other questions as we go through. Great. Thank you, Councillor Breeden. Yeah, and we really are. We're just, we're, I'm just wanting to run through just general citywide questions first here. Um, but, you know, as soon as we get through that, we'll be going back to the specific ones. So I promise people we're getting there ASAP. <laughs> um, no worries. All right. Uh, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. Um, appreciate your leadership on this hearing and as ways and means chair. Um, I know this first session is more on citywide um, budget related is issues. So I'll, I'll keep my specific comments um, for the next session. But um, one, one question I would like to ask is, you know what impact the this pandemic has on our capital budget, especially our capital budget as we go, uh, you know, next year and in the year after. Revenue is not going to be coming in. Are we projecting uh, what our revenue stream is and 
what decline that will be and if it's a you know a certain percentage of a decline what impact does that have on capital projects already scheduled in the pipeline or just projects that that might start this fiscal year um that's one question and if that is the case would there be services that would be cut to shift that funds ship those funds over to another section of the budget to the capital budget or um or what else is there to do what else could we do as a city to make sure that those funds that are allocated for the capital budget remain there you know are we looking at different revenue streams that the city could um could consider um, i know some of it would have to be approved at the at the state level but is is that something we are we are considering um i'm also i also would like to know is as this recession continues what impact does that have on the companies that are in boston that are laying off workers that may have had a tax um tax break or tax incentives from the from the state or city if they were to downsize and leave what impact would that have on our capital budget on our on, on our city budget um and are we encouraging companies now um knowing that they're a key part of the future of boston are we encourage encourage them to be more supportive of the city maybe in terms of of revenue so that we can have a we can continue to have an educated and educated workforce coming from the bps so they they can get these jobs but what role would the business community have in in helping us um going forward on capital projects that would be beneficial to the company but also to the residents of boston so like council braden my my questions really revolve around the recess recession that we're we're in what impact will that have on the capital budget on the city budget um i think it's critical to know those answers um as we go forward and in like you council block i know um you know public education there's not a public school you've highlighted there's not a public school in 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 your district that's that's a critical issue that i certainly um certainly would su certainly support i know our districts um border each other but also for other neighborhoods that don't have the city resources in them such as the the downtown area the south boston waterfront areas of the south end or, or, or roxbury you know what what type of capital projects can we invest in such as um we don't have a police station or a fire station ems down the south boston waterfront those are the types of projects i'm also interested in learning more about as we as we go forward so thank you uh, thank you council block Great, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, Councillor Janey. Madam Council President, you there? Uh, how are you? Um, thank you, Chairwoman Buck. Um, I'm also interested in the impact uh, of COVID and how that impacts the, the capital budget as well as timeline. Um, and I'm wondering too, how this impacts um, the, the federal money coming in from the state, you know, through the state, how all of that uh, ties together. So those are my general questions. Obviously I have uh, some questions related to some specific projects, um, but I get the sense that you wanna hold off and wait on those. Yeah, we're just doing a quick round of these general questions and then we'll go straight to projects. 
Yeah, so I would be interested in how the COVID pandemic is impacting the timeline of projects as well as the actual budget. Um, and and um, are we seeing, uh, do we have to dedicate less money from the city because we're now getting maybe some federal resources in? What is happening? How all the, the pieces are coming together? So those are kind of my, my general uh, questions, just understanding the impact on the capital budget in terms of dollars and timeline and what this all means in terms of the federal or state resources coming into the city. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Councilor Anissa Sabi george uh, Thank you, Chair, and thank you everyone for being here this morning. I think this is an interesting way to try to do this and uh, hopefully um, it's, it's helpful for the hearings going forward. So a lot of my interests are, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep them to a very specific citywide impact, but places and, and things that I'll have questions about through the capital project will either come, I think, through tomorrow's hearing um, or the, the cap, I'm sorry, next week's hearing on the capital budget or may be deferred, I think, to specific departments. Uh, I filed a hearing order on uh, developing a feasibility study around a new crime lab for BPD, which certainly has a, a citywide impact. I think that um, I'd like to hear about that. I don't know whether that's better placed in the conversation with Boston Police and their budget. I certainly have questions about B build BPS uh, that I brought up the other day during um, one of the two BPS hearings around a uh, not a phase two of the current build BPS, but future develop future investment. Uh, in, in rebuilding and building our school district. Lo the Long Island Bridge and the work around um, a recovery campus, where does that stand, both in the permitting process, and I think we may hear about that tomorrow, but the permitting process and our, our ability to invest in that for the long term, again, certainly has not just a citywide impact, but a, a regional impact uh, beyond, uh, beyond the city's borders. And um, related to that, um, although not exclusively, our work around uh, our investments in our homeless shelters, the ones that the city runs, both Woods Mullen for women and Southampton Street uh, for men, we see with this current uh, crisis an investment in some of what's happening there operationally. Um, and would there be or could there be any dollars to invest in both of those shelters in particular, uh, although we know some federal and state funds have been invested in some of the privately operated shelters, could there be any opportunity for real capital improvement in those shelters um, that way? Uh, there's also some questions around, um, also probably in one of the public safety or the fire hearing around some of the uh, investments citywide to our fire department and, um, some of sort of the, the, the longer standing or larger reaching um, investments in some of our coastline protections. Councilor Flaherty brought up, um, I think uh, a portion of East Boston, but really how are we looking at the entire coastline, uh, but also where are our investments gonna happen? And I think that they're certainly through the capital budget, where will those happen across the city? Because we know um, through Councilor Wu's work and Councilor O'Malley's work, some of the efforts around the wetlands, but I imagine that there's an opportunity there for, for some significant um, capital improvements there. Uh, but generally, I think how we all feel and a great deal of our questions will be related to the impact of COVID-19 on, um, on our city and whether or not this pandemic, what's the significance of this pande pandemic on longer term uh, planning and investment in our city. So I think that that's sort of general enough, um, um, although it's not the limit to the questions I'd have uh, for that hearing, but more to come for sure. And I'll um, wrap up for me now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, yeah. And obviously when we do the next round, if people have at-large counselors can also raise specific questions location-based. Um, since uh, starting, we've also been joined by Councillor Frank Baker from District 3, Councillor Matt O'Malley, District 6, and Councillor Michelle Wu at large. Um, so I'll go now to uh, Councillor Baker. And just, uh, just to review, I'm not sure if everyone heard, we're basically just doing a quick round of questions that people have that are relevant to either the structure of the capital budget or sort of citywide issues. 
Um, and then as soon as we're done with that, we'll circle back and start doing the kind of project related specific questions that people want to raise for the administration. So, um, so in this first round, if, if you can stay focused on, uh, on the general overall stuff, that'd be great. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Chair, Chairwoman. Um, similar to Councillor Asabi George, I think I'd like to hear on the discussion of what's going on with Long Island. Um, how far out does this pandemic, how, how, how does this pandemic affect timeline on that? Because as we all know, it's, it's crucial in, in um, helping to heal our populations in Boston. I'd also like to um, just kind of get a sense of where the administration is on in the capital budget. These, these, um, these capital plans that are, the, these projects that are happening now getting ready to finish or are already in the ground, what's gonna happen with the projects that are three years out that are slated to start in three years? Does that mean uh, uh, like say in district three, if something's getting ready to start in two and a half years or three years, do I now expect that to be four years, five years, if we could kind of get a sense around that. And 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 uh, like most other people, it's just to see how how our budget's gonna react with the COVID, with the COVID pandemic happening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, Councillor Matt O'Malley. Uh, thank you. Madam Chair, um, I want to again echo. I think what what everyone says is, as we know, the capital budget is often over a five year period. Um, so many of these projects begin as a study or as some preliminary work, and then as the years progress, more money is allocated. Obviously, I think the biggest concern that we all have, as has been articulated uh, almost to a person, is that what is going to happen if we've got a more robust uh, budget with increased resources this year. And then given the likely financial impacts, dr dramatically impactful uh, budget impacts going forward, uh, what that means um, for a project that may begin in fiscal year 21 or 22 and going on forward. So that's it. I similarly wanna echo the uh, issues raised by a number specific of councilors, specifically Anissa and Frank, as it relates to Long Island Bridge. While it is a capital project, it clearly is a citywide one. Um, and also, you know, the, the capital budget process, the capital projects um, often are uh, the most, the, the, uh, the most uh, vigorously debated uh, portions of our budget. Um, and it also, other than Boston Public Schools budget, it, it is typically where we hear the most from our constituents. So how do we both balance, um, you know, what, the changing economic landscape is going to look like while at the same time recognizing that we have to obviously all invest in parks, playgrounds, libraries, etc. Um, I would ask if I could just make one quick pitch. I'm going to try to go to E13 shortly uh, in my district where the drive-by for Officer Ramirez happened. So if I could just make one uh, pitch, and I know some of my large colleagues will as well, about a specific project that is my uh, chief priority. Sorry about that, my phone just rang. Um, and that's Billings Field in West Roxbury. And I'm going to uh, recognize the fact that it's a, it's a location that has been, um, is well used constantly. We have not seen a full renovation. It's something that I will continue to push for and is really the, the uh, largest focus of capital projects for me this, this budget cycle and ask for your support as well, even though it's clearly West Roxbury Field. Uh, kids from all over Southwest Boston and beyond utilize it. Um, it's it, it, a number of sports leagues are there. We've seen um, so many volunteers really adopt it, um, but it is high time that we follow what so many other great fields have had in terms of a full renovation. We need it. The Boston Foundation recently did a report that I believe all of us or uh, most of us are familiar with that talks about how population shifts have changed in the city of Boston. You haven't seen many uh, increases in school age children except in two neighborhoods. In Hyde Park, there's been a 6% increase. In West Roxbury, there's been a 16% increase. We lead the city by a dramatic number, so we really need to invest in Billings Field. So uh, it's my number one priority, uh, and I hope that we can uh, all support it. Again, it's in District 6, but children and young people from all over the city use it, uh, and it's high time that we are able to invest in it properly. So thank you for letting me go a little off topic, uh, Madam Chair. No, oh, thank you, Councillor, for that. Um, and and I'll just say that if you if you or your staff want to send further 
questions along about district six specific things if you have to go we're happy to add them to the working session questions list so great thank you i'll probably do i'll probably do that after the fact but thank you uh, madam chair thanks all right um councillor michelle Wu, and then it'll be councillor julia mejia and then we'll be back up at the top Hi everyone. Um, I'm sorry I, I popped in a little bit late, so I'm sure some of this has already been addressed. I think I came in um, towards the end of Anissa's uh, comments about and, and echo a lot of the same questions on how the. Oh, actually, maybe I don't. Anyway, I can't remember where I came in, but I agree that it, most urgent is to understand how COVID impacts the uh, the kind of economic impacts of COVID, then feed into the capital budget planning. Um, I'm, I don't want to give up our um, climate sort of intersection with how we're thinking about new buildings, how energy efficient they may be, the city's push to um, move towards 100% renewable energy sourcing just on our municipal footprint, where are the plans for that. Um, we had gotten a couple cost estimates in a hearing that um, Michael and Matt and I had hosted, I don't know, it must have been a year, two years ago where the administration gave specific numbers for what it would cost to move to 100% renewables through um, credits versus through installing some solar panels through, um, you know, going to all in a sort of more scaled up version and just want to know how that fits with this, especially because we are seeing that our emissions targets and hitting those goals are directly then impacting people's susceptibility um, to COVID and how hard it is hitting them. Um, would um, want to know about how our build BPS plan is now um, on track or not on track. What's the the latest in terms of facilities on that end, and whether there are more buildings being added to it? Again, given how urgent the health impacts are and and the health and and safety conditions within each of our school buildings, where so many young people and our staff are spending all of their time. Um, and just in general, it'd be good to get back to basics on the capital budget of how often are we planning maintenance at what levels of all of our buildings to ensure that we're not just constantly cycling through. How are we thinking about swing space for new projects and, and renovations? What's the plan with Court Street? Um, I think there are some lingering big picture questions that it would be good to get into the, the baseline presentation as well. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Great, thank you so much, Councillor. Um, next up is Councillor Julia Mejia, and then it'll be Councillor Ricardo Arroyo. Um, Councillor Arroyo, uh, as, you, as you've joined, I just wanna let you know that we're we're doing a round right now of questions that are about the citywide capital budget, um, whether sort of how it operates or is planned for COVID impacts um, or like a citywide capital investment. And then as soon as we finish this round, we're gonna go back up to the top and do specific um, district level type projects. So uh, now I'll recognize Councillor Mejia. Uh, Councillor Mejia, you're muted. There we go. Good, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bach. Okay, so um, I have a few questions. Um, just curious, uh, were there any projects that were selected this year that were also selected last year? I just wanna kind of see what that pattern looks like. Um, I'm also curious about uh, among the projects that were chosen, how many um, of the contracts to fulfill these projects were given to minority and women business owned. Um, I am also curious about the breakdown of these projects by neighborhood. How many, um, you know, in terms of the city, why like just would like to see what that looks like. And I am also very curious as uh, uh, my colleague, Councillor Reedin um, asked in regards to the community, uh, the community engagement piece about uh, just on a citywide, uh, I'm really curious about the way we go about planning um, and, and engaging communities in these conversations. What budget is being set aside to increase the level of engagement um, in, in communities uh, so that we can have a say in, in, in some of these decision-making processes. 
Um, and then I hear that the breakdown was already in my packet. Thank you, Frank Baker, for that little FYI. I appreciate it. Um, and I am, I have some questions specifically to uh, BPS, and I guess I'll just wait for those um, to break them down further when we when we get to that point. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, Councillor Arroyo. Thank you, Chairman Bach. I have heard the whole uh, hearing so far, so I'll keep it general. I heard most folks already have asked the questions I would have on, on the citywide general budget, which is the impacts of COVID-19 moving forward on the capital budget. Uh, and then for the more specific neighborhood things, we can drill down on that later. So it's really for me, what impacts are we expecting on the capital budget due to COVID-19 planning? Um, and what impact will that have on the city as a whole? Is it going to be neighborhood? Is it going to be ratioed out by neighborhood? Are they going to are certain projects going to be given priority? What what's the deal there? And that's that's basically it for now. I'll I'll drill in on the second round. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Arroyo. Um, and uh, we've also just been joined by Councillor Lydia Edwards. Um, so Councillor Edwards um, is now with us. So Councillor. Edwards, um, this would be, I'm, we're just finishing, you're now the last person in this uh, round of initial questions about the capital budget overall and citywide projects. Um, so as soon as we finish this, we will go back to the top and do district specific questions. But if you've got uh, questions around anything citywide um, or about the structure of the capital budget, um, now would be the time to raise them. So uh, I'll recognize Councillor Edwards. Oh, it was perfect timing. Uh, thank you. I apologize uh, for being late. I had a family matter, um, slight emergency to deal with. Um, it's been resolved. Um, I really just wanted to make sure, and I'll review majority of the presentation. Um, most of my questions are district specific, however, and um, I believe a lot of the other questions about the funding will be resolved or discussed in the subsequent hearing we're having on the property tax and the, um, or the delayed property tax implementation. So I'm gonna reserve my questions for district, district specific. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. Okay, all right, so now we will go back up to the top. Um, I'll, I'm gonna defer mine just because uh, I, I know some people have time constraints and I am obviously here for the entire hearing. Um, so uh, I will next recognize uh, Councillor Flaherty. Councillor, if you want to, um, now now we're now we're getting into the nitty gritty of if there are specific capital projects that you would like the administration to come prepared to. Good. To Thank you, Madam Chair. So East Eagle Street Shoreline uh, Capital. That's obviously um, it's they're very specific, saying it's for shoreline stabilization. So would really like to get the specifics. Uh, get some requests over there to. Kind of dive in and find a little bit more about uh, the East Eagle Street shoreline uh, project over in Eastie, and that's um, that's why I suggested maybe a, a, a schematic or some type of uh, graphic that might be helpful. Uh, clearly, the same with City Hall Plaza. Uh, when will Phase One begin? I I represented this council when I joined the council back in 2000 on the City Hall Plaza Task Force. So finally, glad 20 years later, something's going to happen out there, but. Um, I know that there's some concerns as to when it will start and what, if any, impacts it will have uh, sort of on the day-to-day -day operation, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, renovations uh, on our, our side of the building, if you will, when, um, when we're in session. So we need to make sure that uh, folks that are, um, that are doing it are cognizant of our, our meeting schedules um, so that there's no disruption. And obviously, Curly Recreation Center uh, was one that um, has, has been in the Capitol but um, it got paused because of um, uh, because of uh, climate resiliency uh, issues and questions. So um, they, I believe, they've addressed uh, some of those concerns and/or maybe including uh, some of the resiliency plans in maybe a revised um, capital for Curly Recreation. But uh, I know Council Flynn and I have been uh, working along with uh, uh, you know, state leaders as well as our congressman to uh, make sure that um, the funds are there and that the community is involved in the process. So uh, currently the building is, is closed because of uh, the COVID-19 response. Um, maybe an opportunity for folks to get in there and to, to start to do some of the preliminary stuff, if that makes any sense. But 
most importantly, we want to make sure that uh, the project moves forward and that those climate resiliency um, findings uh, that will now be included will have to be included in the final capital, that those numbers will be adjusted to reflect the climate resiliency and they won't be taken away from other commitments that have been made to the community. So uh, uh, that's in a nutshell. And obviously, and, and to double down on uh, Councilor Baker and, and Councilor uh, Lisa Savi George on the on the Long Island Bridge, just kind of want to get a sense as to where that's situated. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Councilor Flaherty. Um, Councilor Breeden, District Nine stuff. Um, District Nine. Um, I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably not a complete list. Um, we've had, um, I, I already mentioned the Alston Brighton mobility study has been going on for 18 months. Um, it will recommend many uh, small budget uh, improvements to our pedestrian safety and bike lanes, etc. I'd like to know an update on that. And has there been any allocation of funds to support that process? Uh, the BCYF uh, Jackson Community Center is slated, that building is slated to close next July. Um, is there funding to um, plan for planning and uh, prepare, preparation work for the closure of that site? And are there, is there funding uh, allocated to identify and prepare swing space in the neighborhood to replace that uh, community center, BCYF community center? It's the only one we have in our neighborhood of 70,000 people. Um, uh, also with regard to the um, Public Health Commission, uh, there was some discussion about relocating our EMS station in Austin Brighton to uh, a possible site at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. I would like an update on the progress on that initiative um, and their funding uh, implications. Um, the neighborhood uh, development uh, capital budget really just to, to get an update on possible expenditure on um, affordable housing for families in Alston Brighton. There's a lot of housing being built for elders uh, in our neighborhood, but uh, we need to address the uh, lack of, the need for more affordable housing for, for, for families in our neighborhood. Um, on the Climate Ready Boston uh, initiative, um, there's a lot of discussion about the impacts of climate change and sea level change uh, along the coast, uh, but further inland here in Alston Brighton, especially in Alston, we have heat island effects and I'd like to have some discussion about uh, improvements in schools, HVAC, um, uh, if they're able to handle uh, extended heat waves that ex are outside the school year, like May and September. Um, also, um, our tree um, you know, uh, canopy and other, other uh, mitigation uh, approaches that we can take to um, diminish the impacts of heat island effect here in Alston Brighton. We don't expect to see seawater in, in Oak Square, but we will be impacted by climate change. Uh, the fire department, we have a growing um, increased population in Alston Brighton. I just wanted to know if there's any, on, if there's a plan to study uh, the need for possible increased fire, fire safety and um, EMS capacity in the neighborhood with our increased population. And that's all I have for now. And I'll write these, I'm, going to, I'm writing them down, so I'll send them to you as well. Great, well, and we also have, um, we've got central staff on the line who's taking notes on everybody's questions. So. That's good, I don't um, need to type them. No, you don't, you don't need to type them up. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Breeden. Um, Councillor Flynn, District 2. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach, and um, thank you to thank you also to central staff for the great work you're doing you're doing as well. Um, some of the specific issues I had as related to the as related to the capital budget is um, certainly Long Island Bridge is a critical um, citywide issue. Um, and I'd like to get an update on, on Long Island Bridge. As a probation officer, I, I worked over there uh, for almost 10 years visiting my clients on probation. Um, 
So that's an important, important issue for me and for the city as well and for my colleagues. Um, Councilor Flaherty mentioned the City Hall Plaza project, which is also, which is also important. I had an opportunity to review a lot of the studies and talk to the administration staff on that. What, what is also important to me on the City Hall Plaza uh, renovations is ensuring that, you know, we have one of the most open and accessible projects leading into our city government, especially for persons with disabilities um, is critical. That's the welcoming building for, for our city. And we wanna make sure it's, um, it's very friendly for um, persons with disabilities. Um, the Curley Recreation Center in South Boston is, is an issue. Um, Council Fire already fla flagged earlier We've been working with the administration and with state officials as well. Um, I'll, I'd like to get an update on on that project. There's some capital projects that I, I would like to continue to continue to work with the city on, and I've been in discussions with them. And one of them, of course, is the building of a new school. In Chinatown, in Chinatown, which is the Josiah Quincy School, um, that seems like it's going it's going well. It's on track. I'm working I'm working with the administration and with the community on on that issue, on that project. Um, looking at the various locations in the South End, um, especially our area in and around the v Villa Victoria that has a desperate need for sidewalk repair. It's been flagged many times to me by the by our seniors and by persons with disabilities in, in Villa Victoria. I had the opportunity to speak to Rep. John Santiago, who also represents the area as a legislator. And we, we did a walking tour recently, not recently, several months ago. And that was one of the issues we, we are focused on is um, capital improvements in and around that area of Villa Victoria in the South End. Um, there's, there's also one of, the, one of the major issues I'd like to focus on too in the capital budget is, is sidewalk repair. And, it's a critical issue throughout the city. It's a critical issue in, in, in my district as well, but, but many of the sidewalks um, need, need to be fixed, especially for persons with disabilities um, and our seniors. And I noticed some of the, even some of the uh, utility poles are kind of moved in the almost, almost, um, somewhat in this in the center of the of the sidewalk not ne not necessarily the center but we want to make sure that all of our sidewalks um, are accessible for our seniors um, there are other other citywide issues and although this is an issue that focuses on the south boston waterfront but the critical need for basic city services infrastructure in the South Boston waterfront. Um, we need desperately, we need an EMS um, location in the South Boston waterfront. There is an ongoing study. I would like to get an update on that, on that issue. Um, we don't have a police presence there. We don't have a fire presence there and we desperately need we desperately need um, emergency medical services and a fire presence in the South Boston waterfront. The, the current location, the nearest location rather is um, K Street in South Boston or D Street in South Boston and surrounded by um, High Street and up in all over Pearl Street area. But if there was an emergency situation in the waterfront um, with the ongoing traffic, 
backups, we, we desperately need a, a fire presence and an EMS presence there as well. Um, again, um, want to see what the latest plans are for the Blackstone School in the South End as well. Um, it, it, needs, it needs work. I've, I've had a tour recently and met, met with the principal and was there, was there for the, uh, was there several weeks ago. But I, I, I'm gonna hold off and, and not continue and I'll let someone else take the opportunity to talk. But there's some more questions I have, but I, I can forward those on to Councilor Block as well. Great, thank you, Councilor Flynn. Thank you for all those. And also, um, yes, if you forward those questions along to me, colleagues in general should know that if you if you send those, um, ideally it would be a, it would be great to get everything by the end of the day, so that by tomorrow we can pull together the formal set of questions that we're sending over to the administration. Um, so yes, but thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. Thank, thank you, Council Block. And uh, all right, next up is Councilor Janey. Councilor, Council President Janey, you there? All right, uh, don't see her, so I'm gonna, well, I do see her, but I don't see her. So I'm gonna skip her for now. Council President will come back to you. Councilor Frank Baker, District 3. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of things I'd like to, I'd like to understand um, projects like Moakley Park, because that ties into um, other major projects that are happening around there, specifically the Kazusko Circle and Morrissey Boulevard, which are state projects. So I'd just like to get an update on where we are with planning on those things. Moakley Park, part of that was, I think we got a million dollars in federal funds to plan for resiliency, which would have tied into all the other projects. So just kind of an update on that. Um, if we are still in contact, or I'm hoping that we're still in contact with the state on these, but 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 how far along are we in planning? Is that something that we just plan on picking back up in October? And also um, to echo Councillor Flynn, will our sidewalk budget be affected by this? So we, there's a certain amount of sidewalks that are already slated to be to be done, and um, can we, can, can we plan on those still happening or, or is that something and that will be affected? Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Baker. Um, Councillor Janey, back to you, District 7 specific stuff. Hello, are you guys there? I'm so sorry. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, um, I had some specific questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, specific to my district, uh, different capital projects that are underway. One, uh, the Dudley Branch Library that looks you know, incredibly amazing. Just kind of want to understand where we are in that project. I know it was a multi-year um, project and it's almost done. Um, Madison Park High School, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks who have been advocating for a new facility. In the interim, they have a lot of deferred maintenance issues and projects that need attention. I believe the electrical work is, is already uh, planned in this budget, but there are some other issues. I want to get a clear understanding if they also plan on dealing with the roof. You know, there was a leaky roof issue and there are a bunch of things there. I think in terms of a larger reno project for Madison, I'd be interested in that and not just this piecemeal uh, tackling of these smaller projects and, and uh, how we do that in a thoughtful way that engages the, the community, not just the Madison community, but the, the broader community and what it means to have the only uh, Vogue Tech school uh, in our city and, and what that would look like in terms of swing space uh, in the school because um, to do those renovations and to keep that site there, we would have to do it while the students uh, were, were present. So, um, and then there are some issues also at uh, O'Brien, which is uh, right next door. Um, wanna understand what's happening with the Franklin Park Yard. Um, 
Let's see. I think that is it for me for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Council President. Um, next up, uh, Councilor Arroyo, District 5. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just to uh, dive into uh, the specifics that I'm going to be looking at, we have some major transportation projects in the district, uh, Cummins Highway, uh, Mattapan Square. Uh, I believe there's some work uh, being, there's some design work being done on High Park Ave. I don't think there's any budget money in the capital budget for it, but I'd want to talk about whether or not we could make that happen. Um, so for, from my standpoint, a lot of my major questions are, are about local transportation projects that either were already underway, uh, had studies underway, um, and just, I know some of that is being funded by the state as well. So the way in which those things are gonna work uh, moving forward, um, because I believe, you know, we have some projects on the capital plan that are already in construction, um, but those ones have been heavily planned and I don't believe they've broken ground on a lot of those improvements yet. So uh, just getting an update on that and how that'll be impacted uh, and then beyond that, all of our community centers were essentially being had some form of work planned for them for the most part, uh, the BCY of Hard Park Community Center, the Mattahunt Community Center, um, and just making sure that those projects are on, on task as we uh, try to make sure, you know, moving forward in a COVID-19 future where people may need those resources even more than they did before. Um, so those are major questions for me that are more district specific. Um, in some senses, they're citywide specific because we have the capital plans for uh, traffic lights and, and things like that. And I want to see where all those things are. Um, but specifically in, in my district, I don't, I can't speak for others, but I know we have some major transportation plans that I would like to make sure stay on track. So that's going to be a focus of mine. Um, and, you know, as I get more questions, I'll make sure to send them into you by tonight. Is that, is that basically what would be best case? Yeah, that would be ideal. So we're the ideal thing is that the central staff is taking notes on all these questions right now. And then yep. if, after we finish the working session could send us any further questions by, you know, the end of the day today, then that way tomorrow we can send them over to the administration in advance of next week's hearing. Great. Um, and so in that sense, um, not sure if it comes out of capital, to be honest, but uh, there's certain things that we get asked all the time as district counselors uh regarding you know speed bumps road traffic calming measures things like that um so in the transportation question will be you know where's the funding for that going to be at uh, are we going to be able to keep having that moving forward because i know it's it's something that even in a very short amount of time has been heavily requested in my district um so just making sure that transportation projects are on track uh and then from a citywide perspective where the transportation budget is uh, as it relates to safety measures and, and street lights and things like that. So that's that's it here. I'll send in everything else, and I echo you know other people who brought up the the Long uh, the Long Island Street Bridge, right? So those kind of things are obviously um, an issue for me as well, but more district specific. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Arroyo, uh, Councillor Edwards, District One. Thank you very much. Um, I have several questions, but I, I will just kind of list them off in terms of the projects. Um, just first wanted to make sure that the, the city's investment in a task force for the traffic in East Boston, how was that going to be funded or was it going to be part of the capital budget if there were any recommendations made by the task force that was announced during the State of the Union or State of the City? Um, there was also some major projects that were started or were supposed to start from last year's capital budget. I'm wondering if they're going to, um, specifically the uh, BCYF pool at Paris Street. We also had a senior center. We were celebrating the opening or starting that. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, we the McArdle Bridge uh, also it was a huge project for us in East Boston. We have the North Washington Bridge between Charlestown and the North End. I'm curious about its any delays or concerns. What was more efficient was for the city to build a separate bridge night, right next to it. And I'm curious if that is still gonna continue and what delays that will cause. Um, I've been asked and will continue to be asked about having additional police detail uh, once, especially we start having our traffic concerns again and how we're going to compensate in any way, shape or form for police being out there. Uh, the suggestion I had before 
was about using uh, crossing guards uh, who are part of the police department, who are um, part of that um, that team and they are part of a union. So not knowing why we weren't using that resource. Um, just moving over specifically into the um, Edwards Middle School or Charlestown, the Edwards Middle School is slated to get $500,000 for a retrofit. I'm concerned uh, again with COVID happening, if we're gonna continue to move on that um, while, or if there's any delays in East Boston going to the sixth grade. Um, I also think there's $7.2 million investment, which is great in the upgrade of the kitchens in Charlestown. We started in East Boston last year um, to get the fresh foods uh, program and wanted to make sure that that was still uh, going on in terms of uh, assuring that we have fresh food starting if we if and when we do start uh, school this fall. And um, oh yes, the police station that we did kick, we all were there for the groundbreaking. Um, I'm curious uh, what this does to the deadline and timing around that time uh, specifically. Uh, in that same area in East Boston, we have an issue with flooding. We have an issue with traffic, and I do know that there was issues with just outright safety of people getting hit with the local company. There's been start and stop conversations about the city actually acquiring that land in East Boston, and so wanting to see if that's going to be part of any capital budget or any public uh, budget increase in uh, increasing the land for the city of Boston for safety reasons. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and email any other specific questions we had on playgrounds, open space, and commitments the city has made um, for Doherty Playground, for the Edwards Playground, um, and uh, the Greenway in East Boston. Oh, and the Foster Foster Street Playground as well in the North End. North end. Um, I believe the Nazaro Center finally is supposed to have its design or be moving in that area as well, and I just wanted to make sure we were still moving on time for that. Is that all? Nope, but I'll email you the rest. <laughs> That's good. Um, all right, thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. Um, Councillor Mejia. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, all right, so I, I do have some questions and you know, Kenzie as the buck, you'll just let me know whether or not they belong in this bucket or somewhere else. But um, I, I'll ask, questions that I think fall in this category. So I'm curious, like um, um, Councillor Janie mentioned, I'm also curious about um, some of the work with Madison um, Park repairs, such as the leaky roof um, and other issues that are chronically being disregarded at Madison Park. Um, I'm also uh, like Councillor Flynn, uh, looking to advocate for um, Villa Victoria and the sidewalk repairs. Um, I know they're already on the budget, but how are we addressing specific neighborhoods with high needs is something that I'm very curious about. Um, and then this is something that where um, Councillor Buck as the chair of this, uh, of the Ways and Means, you might be able to let me know if this, this lives somewhere else, but I'm just really curious about how they're planning um, in terms of post COVID-19 with parks, are we gonna, are they considering adding hand sanitizers and, and like making sure that the parks are, uh, are ready to receive families uh, post the COVID-19 era? Just wanted to know if that falls within this preview and if it is, please add that as a question, like in terms of um, planning. And then the last thing, um, and again, I don't know where this falls, but um, in terms of the environment and, and issues of climate. I know that in, in communities where we see a high peak of violence during the summer, I mean, aside from kids being out of school, I, I do know based on some of the things that I've learned along the way around climate, is that um, just thinking about uh, the heat, the heat waves in, in certain neighborhoods, I'm wondering if there's, uh, if there's gonna be any money put aside for more trees in, in certain neighborhoods uh, to kind of help uh, cool things down a little bit, if you will. Um, and uh, just kind of figuring out what that looks like. And if this falls within this conversation, then that's something that I'm definitely gonna wanna hear about what the, what the rollout looks like and what neighborhoods are we planning to target as it relates to more trees in certain neighborhoods. Because as we know, high rates of asthma, violence, all of those things are interconnected. So I'm just wanna make sure that we uplift that. Thank you. 
Does that belong in this place? Can you just- Yeah, so thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, yes, I think that the administration has put a doubling of funding for new street trees in the budget for this year. Um, and also has increased money for an urban forestry plan and for kind of the operations of maintaining the trees. So, but I think the the specific, the doubling is in this capital budget. And I think it's a, I think I, I mentioned up at the top, I think the council sort of asking about what does the rollout of that look like? And, you know, where, you know, like you say, where are those gonna get planted? I think is a, is a thing we should definitely take up in this. Um, in this hearing and I mean and then the question about how to handle the parks at, in light of the pandemic I suspect might get pushed to parks and rec to the hearing that we're having dedicated on them um but I think just for folks reference I think we'll put all the we're gonna send all the questions oh wait I do I do have one uh sorry no I, there's one more um and this in um and I know our president um, is all about her district seven. Anytime you even step foot, it, even a, a pinky toe in there, she's letting you know that you're in her district. So I, I, I know this is in her district and I'm curious about um, Gertu Howells. It's a park, a civil rights um, memorial. Um, I know I, I don't have all of the details in terms of where that um, project uh, stands, but I am curious about our support for that particular park. And, um, and this is something, it's in Roxbury, I know that for sure, but I'm just curious as to um, if we're gonna be making some investments there. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just say what I, what I was saying is that um, we will, we'll send all the questions over to the administration and it may be that some of them get uh, explicitly bumped to a different hearing if it feels like the person who really can speak to that is going to be in a different hearing but we'll be asking the administration to flag which of those are getting bumped and making sure they're being addressed in a different hearing so they don't get forgotten in general so so thank you so much and now um i'll recognize councillor asabi george uh thanks uh, thanks councillor bach i just i just jumped back into the meeting so i don't have any further questions i'll watch to make sure that uh, my my questions were asked and if they weren't, I'll send them over. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, um, definitely. This was the round of sort of specific project level questions. So, and we're-, we're Well, let me, like actually, let me just, um, if you don't mind, then I'll, I'm gonna just no. take a quick minute. Um, I suspected you might have a list in front of you. So. I mean, I do, you do know that I do have a list, but I will, I'll, um, I will review the tape and I'll check. I know Jess Rodriguez, my chief of staff has been tuned in. So I'll double check with her and circle back in a, in a, a next round, just in case. Um, I will say, since I've got the microphone unmuted at this moment, um, I did step out to uh, attend the um, procession for um, a police officer that we lost uh, this, this week from COVID-19. It was just a really moving um, tribute um, to him and to his service to our city and just just wanted to share that I know Councilor O'Malley um, jumped off as well to to uh, exceed him and to make a plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor, for sharing that. Um, I will now do my uh, district um, do my district eight questions. So uh, which I have a number. Um, but I'll try to run through them quickly. Um, so for District 8, uh, the West End Library, um, the study for that library is in the to be scheduled bucket in this year's capital budget. Um, previous conversations that I've had have stipulated that it was going to happen this year. I think it's really important that it happened this year. Um, also want to make sure that our RFP for that is calling for a sort of capacious study. There's a lot of interest amongst the friends group in the outdoor space in front of the library also being programmed. Um, and uh, you know, this is the library is a real site for the housing over public assets conversation and a bunch of neighbors in Beacon Hill and West End who want to see that happen. Um, so while I know the study is a library facility study and we really want it to turn into a state of the art library. Um, we also want to think about at least the massing and what can go above that. Um, because it's a site with a definite potential for some height to help house our neighbors. And also, I would say real interest in community center type um, opportunities in fusion with the library. So this is a library already. It's one of the most utilized branch libraries in the city. 
Um, it's a library that already in normal times hosts an ABCD food pantry uh, that is closed right now. Um, and we've really noticed the lack of it because it's something a lot of people rely upon. Um, but, you know, they were looking at getting a commercial refrigerator there because they really don't have all the stuff they need for the food pantry. But I think if we're talking about rebuilding this library from the ground up, thinking about do we put a kitchen facility into it? What are the other kind of community center type functions? I just, I really think this is a chance to be analogous to the big collaboration over in Chinatown around a site for a library that could also have affordable housing and could just be a really great public site in a host of ways. I like to see that happen and I definitely don't wanna see the planning for it get delayed. Um, so raising that, um, I think the sidewalk repair, um, there is additional money in this year's capital budget for sidewalk repair. I think echoing a few other colleagues, understanding better how that's gonna be allocated um, and what our sort of plan for accelerating the rate at which we get up to good repair um, on sidewalks is, I think as we think about an expanded capital budget, that's really important. Um, also and a real interest in my district in um, sort of replacing larger swaths of sidewalk at once um, because just patching being a problem and, and also particularly with bricks um, in terms of having brick laying that really serves our um, disability community well and is accessible, it's better to put down a whole bunch all at once. Um, so for instance, the Dartmouth Street Mall, the city did some great patch repair uh, a couple of months ago, but that's, that's this sort of super wide sidewalk that a ton of people use to walk from Newbury Street to the Com Ave Mall. Um, and it's, it's got, it's still got a bunch of accessibility challenges and we've seen like a whole, whole run of brick be replaced before, like on blocks of Marlboro street and interested in that. Um, thrilled about the investment in the Kenmore square block of the kind of Commonwealth mall space in a park that's used by a lot of, uh, elderly, um, low income folks who live in the building across the street, uh, just concerned about. The MBTA, I think, is significantly on the hook for part of the investment in that park and just want to understand how that's going to go forward, given the hole that's been blown recently in the MBTA's budget. And, you know, obviously that's operating and this is capital, but just definitely want to keep an eye on that. It's a really important project to my whole district. Um, want to better understand the Blossom Street project just because there's a bunch of very specific safety concerns, but I'm happy to have that conversation outside of the hearing. Um, Similarly with the Boylston Street changes. Um, I think back on the thing I said about the Kenmore Square Block, the Boston Common Master Plan and the Muddy River Project are both pretty heavily dependent on grants and external funding. So just you know, understanding the security of those sources um, in addition to the city money. And uh, we, um, this is not, I think this is not a District 8 project, but I forgot to mention it up top. Um, understanding the uh, the Boston Housing Authority money, ex really excited to see that. Thinking about the fact that if we do have trouble getting some capital projects sort of underway in time to get the money out the door this year, that there is sort of an unending list of BHA renovation projects um, that are a little bit different from the sort of big redevelopment projects that involve a lot of advanced planning and permit pulling and such. And so I sort of wonder if there's an opportunity to put some more of that pipeline into this capital budget um, at short notice, if we find that we're not able to spend all the money this year easily. Um, and then uh, I wanna raise, I raised already street trees and just the question of um, opening up pits that have been asphalted over. That's a big issue um, in my neighborhoods. There's a real lack of um, street trees really taking hold in Mission Hill. And so I think the money that's also, you know, looking at urban forestry, looking at an overall plan is really important to Councillor Mejia's point about equity and how we make sure that we're really, that we're putting trees in and then nurturing trees in particular in the places where our tree canopy is really thin. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I'm just pulling up one other set of notes. Um, Thrilled to see the investment in the Back Bay Fens path. That's so important and making that whole area, if we can make the Back Bay Fens path and the Boylston Street both accessible to pedestrians and make Boylston Street safer for bikes and just kind of, we could really change the, the 
capacity for all Bostonians to enjoy that area. Um, Cause right now so much of the fen paths are hard for people um, with any mobility challenges to access. And they're so life-giving to the people who live in those neighborhoods. So I just really wanna lift up that that project uh, is really exciting to me and my district. Um, as is the Public Garden Lagoon, the Robert Shaw Memorial work, um, the Engine 33 repairs. There's a lot of great things in this budget. And so I think I'll just land back on the overall point um, that I think many of us have raised of just trying to understand how we how we preserve the robust capital budget that's being proposed here. Um, and really sort of two pieces, make sure that that um, that that stays robust in the years going forward, understanding how that interacts with our overall budget projections, uh, and then really making sure that we can get the money out the door and do the capital work um, in the in the months ahead to help both to help uh, get these projects done and to support our city economy. So I think that's going to be really important. Um, yeah, and then I guess, sorry, I forgot one very specific question, which is where the Mission Hill, the Mission Hill Playground is a three level space and people are just wondering exactly what aspects of it are going to get uh, improved. So I think those are my district eight specific ones. Um, I now see I've got a hand up from Councillor Michael Flaherty. So Councillor Flaherty, I'll recognize you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question um, or a couple of, uh, for the chair. Are there any deadlines um, with respect to um, spending the grant money for capital projects? I guess that would be a question from us to the administration. Um, and I probably need my memory to refresh, but I think that's important um, to, uh, to distinguish if there's any deadlines that are associated with the grant money, particularly given that construction projects, um, uh, unless they're um, an emergency in nature, have been suspended. And I guess I, I, my question is whether or not that threatens any of that funding. Uh, on the same note, sort of in the, in, in the pedestrian uh, safety, reliable streets um, um, realm, I guess, is, is we see, I'm looking at the budget here, there's a sizable amount of that funding uh, is coming from, um, from state revenue fiscal year 21. So I, I guess the next question is, are we anticipating uh, a funding decline if you read today's paper uh, and you and you see what's going on up at uh, up at Beacon Hill uh, with uh, revenues, et cetera, does that threaten uh, any of these uh, capital projects that are going to be uh, funded uh, in part or significantly by uh, state funds? Um, and uh, and you know sort of following the line, uh, I know Council Flynn has done a lot of work around sort of pedestrian safety, but as the warmer weather months are here, um, we have the ability to start striping and take a ride around uh, the crosswalks, uh, lane markings for vehicular and bike uh, travel um, uh, are atrocious. Uh, and so if we wanna talk about pedestrian safety and vision zero, we really need to talk about uh, uh, increasing our capacity to, uh, to have um, our crosswalks in our um, lanes of travel uh, clearly visible along with maybe a, a review of our signage and signaling. I know that we have some uh, hot spots in the city with respect to, to the signaling and as well as signage. So an overhaul or, or maybe a, a review or a appointed task force to, to either sit with each and every one of our uh, council colleagues uh, to learn about where those areas are or uh, to do some type of audit, but uh, that should be included in, in, in the Vision Zero and or some of our transportation Hello. Am I, I might have lost you there, Kenzie. Um, so I guess the ask is that this the, to the administration with respect to the state. Are we are we expecting uh, to see a decrease in some of those commitments, and also um, whether or not uh, the grant uh, the grants have timelines because of the, the halt in, in in construction, particularly road construction and non emergency stuff. So I appreciate your time again, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, and uh, are there are there any other follow ups? If uh, yes, I see Councillor Asabi George. Uh, thank you. I, I had a moment to just connect with Jess, who had been following this session along. 
And, and one question that wasn't asked that I know um, has come up in the past is there was a youth budget um, round and youth across the city had been asked or, and I'm not sure if this came through the mayor's youth council or not, but they were asked to create a capital youth budget using some of the participatory budgeting methods that the mayor's youth council in particular has used in the past for some other funding requests. Can, I'm curious if this could be, I'd like this to be included or at least um, some remarks included about a youth budget and the process of engaging youth and determining that, that budget and um, you know, if this is going to be different than the, uh, an operating budget ask. I think May, the Mayor's Youth Council has offered a um, million dollar budget and they go through some process to determine how that money would be spent, whether there's a, a comparable capital uh, budget investment the same way. And I think that's the only question um, that maybe wasn't wasn't asked um, in my absence. Great, thank you so much, Councillor. Um, if any other councillor wants to has a, has follow ups and wants to raise their blue hand, I will call on you. Um, otherwise, I'll just add a couple a couple more that um, that I neglected. Uh, um, Oh, I see. I see Councillor Mihail. All right, Councillor Mihail, I'll recognize you and then I'll add mine. Go ahead. Uh, you're muted. I'm Go good. Um, and my, my friend Janie's on deck too. I think she wants a question. Yep. Uh, um, so I'm curious, and, and I'm not sure again, you let me know, um, Councillor Bach, but I, I'm also curious in terms of the capital budget as we're looking at um, two areas of interest. One is um, senior housing uh, and looking at where, where, where are we in terms of the senior housing um, developments as well as I'm curious about um, uh, students, specifically young people who are aging out of foster care. I'm wondering what capital um, investments are we looking at in terms of housing for um, the, the students who are aging out, out of foster care. And I'm not sure if, again, this is, if this is, I'm looking at this as a capital budget and it, it may be in the housing, I don't know, but I'm just throwing it out there as a, as a, as two different vulnerable populations that I wanna make sure when we're talking about capital investments um, and building here in the city of Boston that we're not losing sight of these two very vulnerable populations. Great, thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just add on that, that, um, you know, I think, I know there's a commitment to some more uh, more money around youth homelessness, and maybe it's something to discuss with DND. Um, but I think that, and and obviously, unfortunately, a lot of our foster um, kids get get caught in youth homelessness. Um, but I also think that you know raising it raising it to see if there's any capital plans on that front is worthwhile. Um, also, on the senior housing, I know the five million that they put in the budget for this year for BHA assistance is for senior housing. Um, but I think as I sort of alluded to before, there's kind of an endless set of our senior housing that uh, needs additional capital investment. So I think that's something more to talk about. Uh, Councillor Janey. Um, <clears throat> hello, thank you uh, for taking me back in. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, I think it was Councillor Flaherty who was talking about Vision Zero and the number of complete street projects. I'm sure throughout the city, certainly in my district, there are a number of them. So I wanna make sure that we have some discussion on that as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and yeah, and now I'll just add my additional notes um, are, yeah, certainly I, I saw in this budget funding for some more of those neighborhood streets projects. Um, I know that in my district, ironically, because there are no schools in my district, almost with the exception of uh, the Tobin out in uh, Mission Hill, um, there most of the neighborhoods in my district are not eligible for even consideration by the by the Slow Streets program because they're not close to a school. Um, and so I think I know that one of the things that's been discussed by BTD is trying to make some more of those kind of common sense traffic calming measures available in less of a sort of full on complete like neighborhood slow streets way, but um, you know, being able to add more tactically, you know, speed bumps here, uh, pedestrian activated lights there. And I would really like to understand 
what funding, if any, is in the budget to ramp it up that way. Um, I also saw funding in the capital budget this year related to Councillor Flaherty's comments about striping to really get our crosswalks up to being restriped at least once every three years. We've got areas, um, certainly especially I would say in the east and west fens in my district where the absence of, of crosswalk striping is really dangerous. Um, and so really want to understand how quickly we're going to, how quickly and realistically we think we can move into that, you know, three year cycle. Um, and whether that means that we can expect those really dire ones to get restriped this year. Uh, pedestrian ramps, there's a reference to getting the pedestrian ramps into a state of good repair by 2030. Want to understand if that's about getting the ramps we currently have that way, or if it's about completing places where we need to add ramps um, or both. And also say that, uh, you know, in, in Beacon Hill, um, where we have added a bunch of pedestrian ramps recently, there's been a sort of longstanding understanding that there was going to be some real work on street repaving in conjunction with that, which hasn't happened yet. So definitely want to have that conversation. Um, excited about the commitment to do seven new dedicated bus lanes in the capital budget. Would love to know where those are slated to be, if they're slated yet. Um, and on the street lighting assessment, just to to understand how we think about, I've had, there are a few places in my district where um, where we have a bunch of elders who have a hard time seeing and could really use brighter lights outside and just trying to understand if any of that factors in or it's much more broad brush. Um, and also know that at, in the fence, we have some sort of questions about consistency of street lighting that's going in um, with lots of different fixtures. So uh, those are a few more, sorry, district eight questions that occurred to me. Um, Anyone else? If not, we're going to jump quickly into the any questions about the public facilities department budget, um, which is very specific. I have a couple, um, but I just want to check one more time if you raise your blue hand if you have any capital project related questions. Okay, I don't see anybody. Um, so, all right. Well, great. Wonderful. We will now we'll now move on to um, just quickly addressing the PFD department um, and then the revolving funds. Uh, and again, people have materials from that from central staff in your emails. Um, obviously, if you haven't had a chance to review them, there will still be an opportunity to ask about them at the hearing. This is just a way of getting questions out on the table. Um, so I'll, I'll lead off uh, just by saying that my biggest concern about the Public Facilities Department connects to what we've all been asking about, which is, you know, how we make sure we still have a robust capital budget in FY21 and actually spend capital money um, because the Public Facilities Department doesn't have a director right now, as a result, hasn't hired some of its senior staff positions. Um, and I just worry is understaffed for executing on some of the capital projects that it is charged with executing on. Um, so just really would like the administration to address that concern. Um, and, and especially to think about whether there's a, like it, whether there's something that we need to do that's different in terms of adding, you know, sort of like accelerated hiring or move shifting some people over or putting more people in other departments in charge of kind of capital projects in their departments for the near term. I don't know what it is, but it feels to me as though it would be a huge mistake if we approved a robust capital budget because we wanted to have these counter cyclical effects and help build things that are important in our city. And then we couldn't get it done because of staffing challenges at the public facilities department. Um, so I just really want to raise that and definitely related to you know, that's both related specifically to their kind of projects, signature projects like City Hall Plaza um, and just and Court Street, um, things like my library study, the West End, but, uh, but then also just this portfolio more generally. So that's my big question about PFD. Um, does anybody else have any questions about the Public Facility Department and its budget? Oh, yes. <laughs> Councillor Anissa Savi. Councillor Anissa Sabi George, I'm, or no, Councillor, sorry. I, all right, I'm gonna call on Councillor Julia Mejia first and then I'll call on Councillor Sabi George. Thank you. Yes, um, I do have a question about facilities. Um, given the COVID-19 um, scenario, just wondering whether or not 
we're looking at adding a bigger budget line item for um, deep dive cleaning um, in, in um, not just Boston Public Schools, uh, but looking at um, the Boston Public Health Commission, 1010 Mass Ave. There are a lot of city buildings, um, looking at the Bruce Bowling. I'm just wondering in terms of just a deeper dive, um, what that budget is gonna look like. Uh, and I don't just mean walking down with a little spray bottle and a little napkin situation. I'm talking about real deep cleaning um, so that when we transition back into um, these buildings that we're well prepared uh, to receive people. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, Councillor Asabi George. Thank you. I think that some of my questions in capital uh, will translate over to some of the facility, um, some of the facilities hearing. But I do wonder, I think in line with Council Mejia's question now around cleaning, is that when we're looking at any upgrades, renovations, whether small or large, that considering the way that we may change human behavior and the way that we interact with the public at many of our public facilities. I wonder if we'll see a change in any of those renovations. So anything that's currently underway, are we going to, um, are we gonna sort of adjust some of those plans going forward, whether it's through design elements um, or anything? And I think that you sort of get what I might be asking, um, although I'm doing it in a roundabout way, but I think that it's gonna impact some of our work going forward. So I'm just curious about that. And I, and I can ask that at the hearing and perhaps I'll have that to offer from the department. That's it for me. Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Councillor Asabi George. Um, any other questions on the public facilities department budget specifically? Yes, I have one more question. I, um, here. I, I'm having technical difficulties. You're back, you're back. Okay, um, yes, uh, I'm just curious in terms of and, and again, this might be a post audit situation here, but I'm curious because we didn't spend a lot of money on um, the snow removal uh, and issues like that and salt and wondering if there's a, any leftover money in that bucket and how is that going to then be reallocated uh, to help uh, with pre um, post um, COVID-19 efforts. Just wondering if there's any wiggle room around that and if so, if they could speak to that and what that looks like. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, yeah, so my understanding is, so there is a there is a hearing order that's been filed by Councillor Flaherty um, in the post audit committee uh, related to snow removal and other monies unspent from last year for FY20. My impression is that unfortunately, so we're obviously still in FY20 right now um, and the, stoppage in economic activity is blowing a hole in our excise taxes, right? So all those things that we're looking at for next year, asking how much they're going to go down, they're gone, they've gone down dramatically in the last month. And so, you know, things like hotels and restaurants and all that. And then of course, like our, our permitting and our fees, right? There's a bunch of things that have gone down. So my impression is that there is a significant hole being blown right now in the budget that this body approved last year. And that unfortunately are sort of extra monies in that budget, like snow removal and mm -hmm. um, and the sort of reserves and stuff are are more likely to go to filling that hole than they are to being left over. But I think it's an appropriate question for post audit um, to ask. And then I have another question in terms of equity and construction supplies. I'm just wondering, are, are we resourcing um, our capital materials from um, minority women and business owned um, the city of Boston. Just wondering what, what that looks like in that space. Great, great, thank you. Any further questions on the public facilities department? All right, seeing none, um, I'm gonna move quickly to um, Sorry, all I'm just trying to, uh, I'm gonna move quickly to the uh, revolving funds. So what we have for people's reference watching at home, um, the city has a series of revolving funds. Um, and these are funds where a city department has like takes in money for some segregated specific purpose and then expends that money on that purpose. So an example of that is the police department has a gym 
members pay fees to the gym and then those those fees go to helping gym fund gym operations same thing with rental fees for the strand theater um, which is one of the uh, dockets that'll be before us next thursday um same thing with uh there's there's one for the city hall um child care uh, uh, parents are paying tuition and then that tuition is going into funding the operations of the child child care center these are not generally huge items um, and so we've bundled them this year together with their departments because they're not kind of the biggest budget items that require intense council scrutiny um, but because they're sort of separately constituted apart from the general city budget they do require like their own um, sort of their own approvals every year and so what the council does is the council actually approves a maximum amount of money that can sit in that revolving fund um, so that they can't, you know, they're meant to revolve to actually spend that money down um, fairly regularly. So the ones um, that we will be, so in general, we'll be discussing those with their departments, but there are a few that belong to departments that are not coming in for a dedicated hearing. Um, and so those are the ones that we'll just be looking at briefly next week. Uh, and the funds that we'll be looking at are, um, there's one for the Strand Theater, which I just referenced. Um, which serves to basically help fund the operations of that city owned theater um, and takes in takes in uh, rental fees that are paid for its usage. Um, there's another one that belongs to the law department, uh, which is basically about activity to recover money for um, third party property damages. So someone damages city property and then um, and then the city brings legal action and recovers money for that property damage. So that's the law department's revolving fund, which is funded up to half a million dollars. Um, and then there's one for City Hall Plaza, uh, which is people you rent City Hall Plaza and then they, uh, and then we collect fees and that helps go to the upkeep of City Hall Plaza. Um, so there's, there's information about everybody, about this in everybody's packet, perhaps the one that might be of greatest council interest is there is one for public art, um, which takes in uh, takes in money from easements within the public way granted by the Public Improvement Commission. So that one's sort of exceptional because it's not, you know, the other ones have that natural kind of rental type relationship. This is more one source that then feeds another. So when the Public Improvement Commission gives permission for someone to get an easement on a public way, they collect these fees and those fees go to funding public art. Um, so I think the public art one, the strand one, the uh, law one, um, and City Hall Plaza are the ones that we'll be considering are the miscellaneous ones uh, next week. And so everyone's got more detail on that in their packets, but I just wanted to see if there are any questions about those that folks want to raise um, for the administration in advance. I see you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards has the floor. I just want to clarify for the legal fund um, how you described it being a, re a revolving fund. This is based off of lawsuits the city is initiating and receiving funds back. So this is based on, um, no, it's specifically, uh, it's specifically, I'm checking this. I think, I think it's, um, no, it's getting, well, it, it, yeah. So the FY20 receipts, it says in the report, include revenue from insurers for damages to city property, primarily mm -hmm. vehicles, fencing, street lights, and signals. And then uh, the expenditures include goods and services for repairs. So it sounds like, so it's, it's not, uh, so it sounds like basically the law department brings these property damage suits. It seems like they're a facilitator then, not actual based off of legal services provided or legal defense is done. So yeah, I, I want, so. yeah. So my my questions, I think, and you can help me understand what's the best uh, hearing to specifically target the law department's budget um, in terms of how much they're paying outside counsel and also how much they're paying um, for to defend uh, discrimination lawsuits on behalf of the city. I'm really curious and by, and a breakdown by department. So as in which department or which agency in the city of Boston is costing us a lot of money in terms of uh, the way that they're, they've been treating or been, have been dealing with their, their workers as a result us having to then defend 
lawsuits from those workers for discrimination, for sexual harassment, and so on and so forth. And I think it's worth us analyzing um, the cost uh, and then seeing it backwards in terms of, so we've had to defend this lawsuit, but let's figure out why we are having these lawsuits to begin with, who's costing us the money. So I'm curious what would be the best uh, vehicle to deal with that. I and don't know that the law department specifically comes up with their budget on a hearing date, but those are questions I certainly have. And I think it's it's a matter of transparency and, and considering also that the, there was such pushback on my colleague's idea for an IG um, for a, uh, internal um, audit or, or inspector general um, that I think it's worth them also justifying why they are still going to outside counsel and why they would, instead of having an IG permanently in the city of Boston. Great. So I think that what would probably make the most sense. So we send, the council sends a request for information um, that's kind of a little more specific than the budget book sometimes provides um, to every department, including the ones that we don't, uh, that we don't have come in necessarily for annual hearings. So I think what we should do is um, we'll have central staff take down those questions and send them to the law department in addition to our RFI request to them. Um, and then uh, see, you know, and ask for those materials as part of our budget scrutiny process. And then, you know, if, if what we get back is satisfactory, great. Otherwise, you know, there's the possibility of adding that to the conversation later in May. We intentionally hold some time in order to make sure that like we get all our questions answered and if something's you know come up that we need that we need to scrutinize more or have people in we have that option so i think that's probably i think we should take those questions from today's hearing and add them to our rfi for the law department great thank you thanks so much councillor edwards um are there any other specific questions on the revolving funds that we're going to be talking about next week Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, you're muted. Can you hear me and see me now? Yes, now we've got both. Okay, so I'm just curious about um, travel, um, excuse me, tourism, in terms of the, does this allocation of funds um, for citywide tourism or is, it the, or is it just encouraging tourism to specific neighborhoods? Um, well, I, I think that it's, you know, it's actually much narrower than that. Um, so it's sort of under the mayor's office of tourism, but it's really specifically about city hall plaza. So it's about basically city hall plaza being rented to groups and then they collect the money. What it says here is that the, the receipts include payments from the rental of City Hall Plaza and the expenditures include payments and equipment purchases related to performance held at City Hall Plaza and public celebrations, as well as spending related to the relocation of City Hall Plaza events, which is something that's going to happen as we go through the renovation. So basically people pay their rental fees. Some of that we have to spend on the events themselves to, so that's like when you see, you know, the scooper bowl or like a concert or whatever, right? They pay their rental fees we use some of that for the hookups and everything that we have to manage when we have an event like that. And then some of it goes into things like those chairs that we set out and kind of like, you know, various festive events, public celebrations on City Hall Plaza. Um, so yeah, so I think it's in the Office of Tourism, but it's not, this isn't a broadly constituted tourism budget. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I'm just curious of what kind of, I'm talking about property damage now, what kinds of property damage suits do the law department file with this one, are we talking about a rock thrown through a window or a, a major property damage? What is the threshold is a question that I have. Um, and you already answered the question around the, the travel and tourism. And, but I'm wondering what if, if opportunities, if any exist for this fund to help increase tourism and, and um, in certain neighborhoods? Um, so it's not just fan. Everybody goes to Faneuil Hall. Everybody does a little freedom freedom walk trail. It's like these big ticket items that everybody comes to Boston to do. I'm just wondering what opportunities, if any, with this particular fund exist to um, have some um, tourism in neighborhoods that have been historically um, not profiled. I think about Dorchester, like that big. Uh, there's a big. I think it's in Frank District. Um, I don't know the name of the church, but um, it's it's in Bowdoin, like a Bowdoin Square area. It's a big old white church. It's I, I think it's first parish church. First parish church. 
Thank you, Asabi, George. Um, yeah, so I'm just curious, what if any opportunities exist to use some of that fund to help drive traffic to other parts of the city that are not so well um, trafficked, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, and that might be a, a question that we should direct to the, maybe even the economic development um, hearing, just because I think that, so, because th this fund is, it's just $150,000. And I think to really put it down in what you're talking about, we would need to be looking at, you know, larger sources. So I think talking to economic development about what it's, what it's kind of citywide neighborhood-based tourism plan is would make a lot of sense. So basically it doesn't fall under this, this another. This, well, this, this, this specific revolving fund is just really, it's just really narrow. Um, and and the state and and the thing you should I I'm not a lawyer so I'll I shouldn't even my understanding about revolving funds is that they're typically meant to have a pretty tight relationship between the thing that the fees are paid for and the thing that the money is spent on because in municipal finance the city is discouraged from having lots of revolving funds that are just kind of like pots of money for random like usage because that's meant to be all general fund um, so I think. So I think this kind it's more like this kind of pay for the gym, fund the gym, pay for the childcare, fund the childcare, pay for the plaza, fund the plaza. Like it's meant to be more tightly tied like that. But we have, but it's a very small portion of our of our citywide budget that's tied up in revolving funds. So I think we should, I think we should raise your question vis-a-vis -vis the general fund. And and um, and again, you tell me if this doesn't belong here, but I'm just curious as to who are there people who, who get elected to sit on a commission to determine who gets the, like who, who's, 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 who's administrating this fund and who's the wizard behind the decision-making process as to who gets, how this money is spent? Great, yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think we should ask about the decision-making on all these revolving funds. Okay, so I have that question yeah. and, um, and so this is just the working sessions for us to prepare for. Yes, that. exactly. So the idea is that this this generates questions that we're then sending over to them, and then we'll have the hearing where obviously the administration will actually be here to answer the questions. And uh, as in terms of our process here, I'm just curious: um, will we know if our questions that we've asked you uh, in this um, session will we know whether or not our questions made it to the final round? and whether or not those questions are going to be asked. Do we ask those questions? Or are you going to ask all those questions? Are, are like, just help me understand the process real quick. Yeah, sure, you. absolutely. So this is our plan. So first of all, I'm not selecting questions. Um, we're just going to, the central staff's been taking note of questions, and we're going to collate all of them and send them over to the administration tomorrow. So again, if folks can get other questions to us in written form by tonight, that would be great. Um, then the way that will work is so we'll have like a big set of questions that we've sent to the administration, right? And that will be a matter of public record. We'll also attach that set of questions and the video of this working session to the public notice for the hearing. Um, and it means that we get to go into our hearing with like, you know, some more things on the agenda. Now, I, what I imagine will happen vis-a-vis -vis those questions is that there will be a set of the questions that we've asked today that get addressed in the hearing by the administration in their presentation. There will be a set of those questions where they say, actually, could we send that question to the parks hearing or could we send it to the library hearing because that's where the person who really knows about it's gonna be. There might be a few of these questions that can be answered by the administration writing back to us in advance and saying, oh, you can find that on this page of the budget book or whatever, right? Like there might be a few of those, these that are like that. Um, and that then, you know, part of the purpose of the hearing is to allow counselors to then ask follow-ups if they feel like their questions were not answered or other ones have occurred to them in the meantime, um, or the answer raises another question, right? So we're still, the hearings are still an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Um, it's just that this is a way of getting a bunch of the things that are sort of most important to counselors out on the table and trying to put ourselves in a position to have a, a more robust conversation next week that isn't, you know, that isn't mainly, oh, let's go find other information and get back to you later, right? So that's, that's part of the idea here. Is that helpful? Yes, very much so. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi.
<laughs> um, aw, that was delightful, Julia. <laughs> um, okay, uh, any further questions, whether on revolving funds, on um, the public facilities department budget? Okay, I see Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Asabi George, you're recognized. So I've got a quick question on how, how the city decides to develop a revolving fund. And I, you know, I, I would love a revolving fund in BPS. I don't know whether this will be the BPS revolving fund hearing or is that separate? And I forget, I'm not looking at the schedule, I apologize. My question specifically to BPS is, we have the opportunity and we have exercised it on occasion to collect funds from uh, invoices we send families who have skirted the residency requirements. And so if we find that a family is inappropriately sending their kids to BPS, um, when, we, um, when we remove that student from our roles, we have the opportunity to bill families for that theft of services. Uh, we see that in our exam schools, we see that in some of our application schools and some of our schools with specialty programs. It's often, and we've had, I've hosted a number of hearings on this, it's often families with significant means that are able to, to steal from the system. Um, I'd like to see a revolving fund created for those um, dollar amounts as opposed to those funds going back into the general fund. I'd like them to go specifically into a revolving fund to support the efforts of that office. Uh, so that's my question. I don't know whether it's appropriate at next week's revolving fund hearing or specific to a BPS one. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll record that question, but we'll probably defer it to, so on May 19th at one, we're having a BPS hearing where the revolving funds are specifically on the docket, the BPS ones. And that's also conveniently the hearing where we're talking about school admission and assignment systems. So it seems like the right hearing to bring Perfect. up. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, all right. Are there any further questions? Anybody who wants to speak should uh, raise their blue hand. Otherwise, okay, seeing seeing none, um, it's 101. I'm gonna uh, gavel this working session to a close. Um, before I do so, I'll just remind um, counselors that uh, if you can get us any further questions you'd like to have included in the question list from today, um, by the end of the day, that would be great so that we can get them out tomorrow to the administration. We'll be having the hearing connected to this working session next week. Um, on Thursday the 23rd. And, uh, and again, I would just remind members of the public watching at home, you can find the whole proposed budget at budget.boston.gov. Um, you can go on the city council's website to read more about our budget process and also to find links for you to testify, um, whether in person, by video, um, by email. Uh, and uh, we definitely look forward to hearing from you throughout this process. So thank you and thank you to all my colleagues. Um, with that, uh, this working session is adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Kenzie. Bye. Thank all. Thank you. Kenzie. Bye. Leave meeting. Leave meeting. We're done. <laughs>